I look back and think back, and it really happened about 41 years ago, as uh, 42, so to, about, so to speak, when Dad let me know that uh, in spite of my plans and my desires to go ahead and uh, go to the University of Illinois and become a lawyer, that I had a household obligation first, and that that obligation would be that uh, I needed to go a year to Bible college. Every one of us kids was supposed to do that, and my sister already put in her year, her time, and that's kind of the way we looked at it. it. was like, oh, crud, it's like prison. And it wasn't all dread and doom and everything, but it was just like, you know, it was kind of embarrassing when all the other kids were going to these big universities and different things that they were going to do. And I could have stayed in farm, but I was going to go to college, but to a Bible college. And, you know, I mean, it's not like I don't want to make it out to be just this terrible thing, but I just sure didn't understand the wisdom of my dad at the time. And why in the world that he thought that that was important? Because I thought if I got my other degree and got going, then I could do it later. And he was wise enough to know that he said, no, you never will. And so his whole premise of it was not just that we were kind of, we weren't Amish, but man, we were out in the country and on the farm and pretty rural, you know. And so he didn't want Amish to go wild. You know, you go to a 40,000 uh, member school and or number of students and all and so I, I think that was a part of it, but even more than that, it was from his heart to ours, he said, I just always wish that I had more of a foundation. I've listened to sermons and everything, but I still have to pretty much trust what the preacher's saying, and I just want you guys to have some kind of a basis in your life that you can get, you navigate your own way through your Bible and that you can know what it says, uh, not just to you know talk and be able to share or to explain, but so that you personally, you know, can defend what you believe and why you believe it. That it's not just because of what somebody said, it's because of what Jesus said or what the Word says. And so that was what was behind it. So kind of begrudgingly, but nonetheless headed in. And, and the first year was fairly successful because of my job. I was able to get on, and some of you know I just am not a big foot-feet person. And uh, it's fetish every bla way negative that there is. It's anti-feet. And uh, so I get a job selling ladies' shoes, of all things, and uh, get to handle a lot of feet, you know. And it, it was just exactly what I thought it'd be. Weird-looking feet, bunions, corns, all that good stuff, and smell, 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 smell. Now, I still can't hardly eat Fritos corn chips, because it just, you know, I thought. But, uh, but you know what? I found out one thing, like some of you have found out, I can put up with a lot if I'm making money, and I did. I was making... $10 an hour when the minimum wage wasn't even $2 an hour. So I was going 20 hours or 21 hours of uh, classes each, each semester and then uh, still pulling down 25 hours working for Sticks, Bear, and Fuller and uh, was able to in the long run, uh, you know, just net 250 bucks a week. So I bought my new Trans Am and I'm good to go. Now I'm ready to be a lawyer, right? And that summer, a guy came out and talked to me. His name was Max Brandon. He's since passed away. And uh, his challenge to me was in regard to ministry. And he said, Steve, he said, I'm glad that you went last year. How'd you like it? And I said, it was good. And he said, what was the best thing about it? I said, I finally started, and it's what I would want for every one of you. I finally started reading the Bible more like a novel instead of some kind of a textbook or science book. And, you know, other than you, well, I don't know, high intensity uh, intelligence, you know, that love textbooks and science books and all that stuff, you know, for most of us, I think that we kind of approach it differently, and it's like, okay, it's reading the rules, okay, it's reading this, it's the have-tos and the have-nots and all, and thou shalt and thou shalt not, depending on the version you get, right? And what suddenly changed for me was I started reading myself into the, into the story, and, and I encourage each one of you, and it's not that I have this great perspective, but what I wanted to do is through these authors was, you know, like in the book of Matthew, the first one of the Gospels, to imagine what it was to go from being a tax collector to Jesus calling you and you follow him. And what all went with that? And going from a fairly wealthy, extravagant life to that which was less than stellar, other than the call of the heart. And then when he'd talk about Jesus, I tried to not put myself in Jesus, other than with some of the things that he had to face and, and again, that's the part about reading yourself into it. And I encourage every one of you, but that was the greatest thing I learned that first year. And nobody taught it to me. It was just I familiarized myself so much with the Bible that it became comfortable. And, you know, those of you that are new to Christ or trying to figure your way out, man, I just would encourage you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John over and over till you get to know Jesus. 
And it's not that the rest of the books aren't any good, and of course I preach from those, but, but man, it's essential that you get to know who Jesus was and you understand why he came. So anyway, in the process, that how to go, and I told him that, and, and I said, and it was good. I mean, I, I did, I learned quite a few things, and, and I said, but some of the things that I didn't care for was, it was just kind of weird to me that they were so legalistic about stuff, and like, you know, if you had a three and a half hour class, you couldn't miss more than three and a half days that semester, or they'd lower your grade. And I'm like, what the crud? I'm paying for the class. You're not paying me to go. Well, they didn't really care what I thought, you know? And uh, I saw some of the stuff, and I would argue or question the thing, so the lawyer coming out of me. But yeah, when they tried to tell me that this one professor, anyway, that Jesus made some good grape juice there in John, his first miracle, I was like, eh, I don't buy that. That doesn't fit the story. It was wine, man. And I wasn't trying to justify wine, but for some of you, you're glad that I did. But, but I wasn't trying to justify the wine. It was just the fact, let's be authentic here, man. Let's not go ahead and, you know, we may be freshmen in Bible college, but you don't have to try to make sure that we think that it wasn't real alcohol, because it was. And they commented about it. And even to the point, they said, when people start to, you know, get inebriated and stuff, not that they did that off of Jesus, it's not saying that, but they, typical wedding, Right. So anyway, the, there were things there jousting back and forth because to me it was about what is the truth. And I know Jesus is the way, the truth in life, and I know that many of us have concepts of what truth, but a lot of it's based off of what? Our tradition, our experience, what we grew up as. It's like so many people, and one of the things that I'm big about not doing is I don't want to be, and nothing against Methodist Christians, Baptist Christians, Lutheran Christians on down the line. But... I love the idea that we're not the only Christian, but we're just Christians only. We're not a certain kind of Christian. It's a Christian. It's we belong to Christ, follow Christ, sold out to Christ, surrendered all to Christ, and still struggle a lot. And that's why we hold on to Christ, right? And so, you know, those concepts came in. So Max ends up, he says, well, okay. He said, so you're going back. He said, I think you're going to make a fine minister. And I said, who said anything about that? <laughs> well, aren't you going back? And I said, I don't plan to. I want to be a lawyer. And he began into, well, why wouldn't you be a preacher? And so what started really kind of taking place next was just that concept, for me at least, that there were things about the church that I questioned. I questioned, you know, we just as well have armed guards at the doors because so oftentimes people would stand there and they would almost look people up and down and shame them before they ever came in. And many of you, maybe like me, you know, there was a certain dress code that was expected, right? And if you didn't measure up then it was they made you feel out of place so that next week you'd come back dressed well the thing they didn't realize was a lot of those people didn't come back next week if you don't like me the way i am i'm sorry and there were other things and people had had reputations that it was sad to me because my whole concept of what jesus came to do was to seek and save the lost and i really felt that church ought to be man we ought to let everybody in Amen. if they're coming and they're looking let them come and look but it's not about us being superior or anything because and I do really believe that the worst thing that can happen is preachers that forget that they're saved by grace and still need it. And the next worst thing is when the church forgets that they're saved by grace and still need it. And I'll tell you, 40 years of preaching, man, and I still need Jesus more than I ever realized I did 40 years ago because now I've experienced more sin and how, what's inside of me. And I don't like it, but I thank God that he's forgiven it. So I went into this little diatribe about all the things I didn't like about church and being boring and everything that way. And I said, then on top of it all, I can't play the game of being one of those preachers. And they said, what kind of preacher? And where we grew up, it was kind of like the, the you know, church's job was, uh, Lord, you keep him inspired, we'll keep him humble by not paying him and make sure that he drives around the car that's got the rusted out floorboards and everything like that. And that sounds really egotistical, but to me, I just didn't understand that. And I wasn't expecting to drive around a Rolls Royce, but man, I mean, I've got a Trans Am, dude. What am I going to do? I've got to sell my Trans Am to be a preacher, you know, probably. Well, I didn't, and uh, have to, nor did I. And um, what ended up then unfolding was he planted this seed, and the last thing that he asked me was he said, well, anybody can gripe about it. What have you done to make a difference? And this is, so I had my freshman year of Bible college. I'm working for Dad on the farm because I grew a new appreciation for... Um, myself in regard to how unappreciative I've been. Uh, what I did have as far as family goes and the upbringing and, and even the, the sometimes to me extremely strict kind of things that my parents put me through, but I saw some guys at school and some people there that, and I realize it's judging, but it wasn't condemnation, it was just 
I could tell nobody had ever groomed them and made them toe the line, so to speak. And so I realized that my mom and dad had given me a great deal, and the greatest thing that they gave me outside of what they did life in bringing me up was Jesus Christ, and they modeled the true Christianity. And in that, then I went home and I wanted to work for dad as a prodigal that wanted to come back and just let me work for you. And so I did that summer. And um, in the midst of it, there was this nagging thing, that question, what have you done to make a difference? Anybody can gripe about it. And I feel like it's a question that still needs to be asked to every one of us that go to church. Are we really making a difference? And it's not that we need to get on a board or we need to be on this committee or that committee or whatever. It's just, no, are we making a difference? If there's something we don't like about church, are we able to look at it and discern what is it I don't like? Is it something I just don't like because this is what I think or feel? Or is it because I don't like because the scripture, it doesn't follow in with the Bible? And one of the things then that God began to do was to give me this, this just a position of... of uh, Okay, so if you go and be a lawyer, if you are a preacher, which way do you win, which way do you lose? Well, I don't know. I don't know the future. So who does? Uh, that would be you, God. And my logic finally kicked in enough, and I'm, I'm just wrestling with it and driving back. My brother and I actually got along, and we went on a vacation in the Trans Am and had a blast going out to Colorado to our cousins, and we're on the way back, and somewhere up there on I-80 uh, in Nebraska, of all things, because uh, there's nothing else going on in Nebraska at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm just like, I just started crying. And because what hit me was, I mean, I definitely believed in the Lord, but I couldn't believe that he would want to call me, because I certainly knew I wasn't good enough or holy enough, and I just didn't see how it would work. But I also began to realize I did not want to take the chance of, uh, if I sought to be a lawyer and did that on my own, I didn't want to ever have that feeling that the Lord wasn't with me. And I'm not saying he wouldn't have been. I'm just saying what it really came down to was what have I got to lose? I've got more to lose never giving him an opportunity than I do of doing what I think I want to do. And I'm not saying that God couldn't have blessed me. I'm just telling you I know he's blessed me this way. And so when I went back to school with the dirty clothes in the car, I mean, that's basically it. Got the Trans Am back there. We unloaded one thing, and I put all the dirty clothes and my stereo in and headed back down and got in on the last day of registration with these things that I asked God that night. Lord, if you want me to go, I've got to get accepted because I didn't know if they would. I've got to get financial aid because I don't have any scholarships for this like I did to U of I. Um, the third thing was, so I need to get my old job back. And uh, the fourth one was, do I really have to go for four years of Bible college and get a degree and everything to try this out. Can we like speed this up a little bit? Because I just really don't think it's going to work. And lo and behold, then uh, middle of September, the f right after Labor Day, uh, the first full week after Labor Day, Luke Perrine came up and he said, uh, hey man, he said, what are you doing this Sunday? And so I told him the church I was going to go to. And he said, well, there's a church on the line that wants you to come preach for them. Would you do that? And I looked at him and I said, Luke, I said, <laughs> First of all, I mean, I haven't had any preaching classes. He said, they didn't ask if you'd had any preaching classes. They said, do you have a student in there named Steve Pettit? We need to have somebody come in and fill in for us. So my first thing is I'm not adequately prepared. But God had already got me enrolled in school. I instantly got my job back. Uh, I was able to get the financial aid to bridge the gap until I could start working again. And... Uh, what I didn't know was he was already answering that fourth question of, do I have to wait? And he's saying, now. And so inside, everything knows I'm inadequate, I'm not prepared, I'm not ready for this, and yet there's that part inside of me that goes, let's get this over with. It's like the Band-Aid, pull it off fast, you know? This just is not going to work. And so when he told me where the church was, I'm going, I've never heard of it, and I lived in Illinois my whole life. And then he said it was a country church. I'm like, come on, God, I was at least expecting, you know? And it was a church of 35 to 40 people, average age, older than me now. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm 19, and the average age there was, it was just so funny because it seemed like they were all in their 70s and 80s. They all had two names, you know, because uh, Southern Illinois, so you had to have the, and, and no offense to you all down here that all go by double names or whatever, but we, the only time I got double name was when I was in trouble with mom. Stephen John, you know, I mean, just like that. But, uh, 
So I pulled in that day, got there early, and pulled in and parked wrong, and they quickly came in and told me, you need to move your car. I guess that's yours out there, that one with the bird on it, you know, and <laughs> okay. And uh, the only thing I had going for me is I was raised in the country, and these were country people, and God knew exactly what I needed. The other part I didn't know I needed, and I'm sorry, but the one that needs to be honored today next to Jesus Christ would be Julie. We'd never gone out, uh, knew each other the year before. But uh, we'd never gone out, gone on a date, done anything that way. And she heard the guy asking, said, I know where that's at. It's only about 30 miles from my mom and dad's. I'll come down and give you some moral support. And some of you have heard me say that before. But I didn't realize what all moral support was, but <laughs> it, was en- <laughs> it was enough to convince me, okay. But she has been with me all 40 of these years. And uh, again, God knew what I needed to counterbalance me. And she gets blamed for being the one that I'm always fun, and she's always the one putting the brakes on, you know. But I like it that way. I've learned how to let her ride the brake, and it doesn't hurt as bad as it used to. But deep down in, I couldn't have a better cheerleader, a better spouse, a better partner in crime. Um, She has truly, truly done it say all that to get on into it. It's not just going to be reminiscing today, but I'm just telling you the biggest thing, if I could convey anything to you today outside of realizing that God brings people to you that you need far more than you think you do, and that I believe that within the church, that when he says that we are a body with many parts, he arranges them as he sees fit, I'm telling you, he knows exactly why, and that's why churches are so divided. It's because the devil never wants us to understand this unbelievable combination of people that are in our lives. People that look weird to you, people that have different personalities, people that um, you just are sure that, man, I have nothing in common with them. God works this because he knows who we need. And I don't know if you've been married long enough to understand like I do, There was a period of time when Julie wasn't all that I wanted, and I don't mean that bad. I just mean that it's like, mom, you know. She really seemed to take on a mom tone to me, you know, probably because I needed what? A mother, you know. Um, but, But it was one of those things that it's just so easy in our personalities to then shove the very thing that you need the most. And I want you, if anything, to discover one another after you discover Christ in you. And when I say Christ in you, I want you to realize, I mean, and I don't mean this half-heartedly, I don't mean this haphazardly, I mean absolutely positively, God has given you, me to you, so that you would begin to grasp if he can use me, the most unlikely subject of all, he can use any one of you, any one of you. And I mean that with all my heart. I'm, I'm talking about in the depths of ministry. Don't presume yourself unworthy. I mean, I'm not worthy. But if he calls you, he will go ahead and continue to develop you as long as you keep walking with him. And I still have a long way to go. Um, but in that time, I've learned. I've not learned how to tell good jokes. So I'm going to share one that Joanna reminded me of when she gave me this thing. And it was about the pirate, you know, that walked in... Uh, off the ship into a a store and when he was there this little kid came up and was looking up and down and saw that he had you know the wooden leg deal and that he had the hook and he had the patch over the eye and began to question so what happened to you mister and he said well he said we're fighting one time and and I if I start doing the pirate thing I'll get into that you know because I like pirates and uh Anyway, he said, so we're fighting on the ship, and this guy goes to stab me, and I have to jump back, and I go overboard. And he said, a shark bites my leg and takes it off, so only thing the doctor could do is put this wooden thing on here. Oh, 
well, what happened with the hook? And he said, well, that was another battle we're going on. Arr, and as they were fighting around, he said, this guy just chopped my arm off. And it's just like there's nothing there. And they didn't know what to do with it. So they put the hook on there instead. So at least I had something going. And I said, the kid says, well, what about that patch on your eye? Was that another battle? And he goes, Arr, nope, it wasn't a battle. He said, that was the first day after I got the hook. And a... <laughs> Got something in my eye, and I went to it. Uh, sorry, I lost the eye. So my jokes haven't gotten any better. I mean, 40 years of joke telling it. But you laugh at me, and I like that. So um, let's make sure this is about Jesus, okay? God and Father, today I'm humbled by you most of all, but by these gifts and treasures of people, Lord, uh, jars of clay that you have surrounded my life with. And I ask your richest blessing upon them today. And I'm still blown away, Lord, that in spite of me and my mouth and my mind, that you will do the divine. And I don't mean by that to excuse myself, but I'm thankful that you do give us grace to grow. And Lord, I just pray today to be able to share and relay things from heaven to earth. But not just that way, not in some kind of a stodgy way, but extremely personal. That God is crazy and off the wall and out of place as I am in ministry. That, Lord, that you would use somebody like me so that they would know that when they hear things, it's certainly not me. It's you. And it's your voice compelling them like you did me. Anybody can gripe about it. What are you doing to make a difference? And, God, I pray that each one of us today would answer that question and we would seek to make a difference. Not in our strength. Not in our way. Not by bull in a china shop, but rather instead by the power that you give to call us to do things that we cannot do without you. I pray, Lord, that this church, that each one of us would, would allow you to grow our love for the lost. And that in that, Lord, church wouldn't be about us, it would be about others. And it wouldn't be about our comfort and our likes and our this and our that and we want. But, Lord, it would be about what do you want and what do others need. I pray, Lord, that we could still be accurate with the scriptures, but not legalistic. And I still pray, God, today with all my heart that we would learn to love like you loved. And I pray, Lord, that in that acceptance that people would begin to believe if we can accept them that you can as well. And that, Lord, that if our performance comes about, that it wouldn't be out of being stage actors or hypocrites on the stage of life, but it would become out of genuineness that we're not playing we're not just trying, we're doing our best to let you work through us even as we outgrow ourselves. So God bless my brothers and sisters here today. Thank you for those that have written, called, sent cards, and even have come today. The blast from the past. And I ask your richest blessing, Lord, as we look at you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, um, it's difficult in some regards to know where to begin, but I would like to look at Matthew or Mark, excuse me. No, I do mean Matthew. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Got mixed up because we're going to go to Mark 11. But Matthew 11. And I want you to know that one of the difficult things for me in ministry was trying to wrestle this thing down as one to preach or bring messages that would be meaningful and, and not just be educational and not just being theologically sound. But I wanted that. But, but I really, really, really did feel like what God called me to do was to talk to you. And when I say talk to you, I mean, I think we all have learned how to use our phones in a variety of ways. And, and most often, I mean, it's like Julie, she's calling her dad every day, and I really admire that. Um, it's not because it's convenient, but it's because she's concerned and cares. And that, um, especially with the newness of, of the empty house, with her mom being, you know, um, at a place there for her Alzheimer's and all, that it's really, really difficult. So she calls him. And when she calls, she always tries to have one or two things she wants to tell him and a couple of questions and to ask him so that he'll tell her about the day. And uh, in doing so, sometimes it's only five minutes and sometimes it becomes 25 minutes, all depending on what's going on and what's on TV next, because he's quick to say, well, my show's on, see you, bye. You know, it's just <laughs> over with. And, uh, you know, but the communication thing, so typically I've got something I want to share with you. I've got some scriptures that I've worked over and tried to try to put together in a way that would make sense. But oftentimes, I clearly admit that there are things that are get added in that I never planned 
my prayer is it's because God's doing the adding, not because I am. And, and most of you have known me, that know me have known that you can certainly tell the difference when I'm inspired versus when I'm being Steve, right? And uh, so it's, it's usually a pretty clear, clear definition there. But most of it comes from because I want to just be really for you kind of like the phone that you hear because God's speaking. And it's not that I'm the source of this. No, he's the source. He wants to call you and talk with you. Now, he wants you to call him. And there's things about even that, and we're going to look at today this praying thing. There's things that God wants us to call him and to share with him and to talk. But sometimes we're kind of like Julie's dad, where, and I'm not making fun or putting him down, but it's like we all, we're busy doing something else. I mean, you don't have to hold your hand up, but is anybody guilty of being on the phone and talking to somebody while you're doing something else? And the truth is, you're really focused more on what else you're doing, not talking to the person. Yeah? Yeah. It happens, doesn't it? And I think we get that way with God, that we know we ought to pray, but as we go to pray, we get other things going and Still, for me, one of the most difficult things is sorting out and disciplining myself to, wait a minute, I don't want to go there. No, this, I'm before you. And it is where kneeling down and having my eyes closed helps me to pray a whole lot more with clarification than I do if my eyes are open and picking up on other things or the TV's on in the background or whatever it may be. And so this prayer, prayerful thing, God wants to communicate to us, but he also wants to listen but in his listening, then he wants us to wait so that he can speak back. Jesus was a master about this prayer thing. And when I say a master, of course, he was a master of all. But what's amazing to me, and most of you have heard me preach a sermon about, that if anybody could have gotten by with a halfway cruddy kind of a prayer life, it would have been Jesus. He's the son of God for Pete's sake, right? But when you go through, and I just encourage you, if you take my challenge, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you go through it, you'll find out that Jesus prayed a lot. He got up early, the crack of dawn, before, while it was still dark, left the house and went out to a solitary place to pray. I think that's in Mark. I think there's another place where it talks about that that night he went out and he prayed the whole night to God. We know that the last night of his life on this earth, he was out what? Praying to God and even to the point of sweating blood. And so Jesus had this intense prayer life and it causes me to go, why? You knew God. You are God. And it's because he knew the power of human nature, which he had. And he also knew the power of the enemy. And so prayer became that defense shield to keep him not just on the straight and narrow, but straight up attached, doing this mission together with God. Now, every one of us that sang that song this morning, I Surrender All, isn't that what we met? meant? And that was exactly what got me into the ministry, was I had sung that song, and I had remembered singing it with tears because I wasn't sure what all meant. And it wasn't until I was confronted with the challenge of, do I want to do what I think would be cool and neat, or do I want to do what God has called me to do? And that's all about prayer. And so I'm thankful to have had a family that we grew up not just saying prayers, but mom and dad taught us how to pray. They let us begin with the little rhymey things, you know, but before long, we had to say our own prayers, put it into our own words out loud. Why? So that we would get used to it. And not be afraid to pray in front of people. And, but the prayer wasn't just asking God for stuff. It was thanking him for things. And then, but if there were things, we didn't have to be ashamed to ask as well. Well, one of the things getting into ministry, that the reason I wanted you to look here at Matthew 11, that really helped me out because I, I love people. I want more than you even think. I want all of you to like me. I want you to be my best friend. I want us just to get along great, and I really want to please all of you. But this passage here I had to read today because it's what I learned early on in ministry. You can't. You can't please everybody. But it's not my job to try to please you. It's my job to please him. He's still the Lord. And Jesus said this about John the Baptist. He said, man, and about himself. He said, to what can I compare? So Matthew 11, verse 16 to what can I compare this generation? They're like the children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. We played the flute for you, and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge, and you didn't mourn. He said, I don't get you. You know, he says, basically, this passage, this little phrase is talking about the idea of, man, you can't be pleased. I try to do something that's happy, and you're, and I try to do something that's sad, and you're going, that's too, too down. You know, it's just really difficult. And especially the more people you get, the more difficult it is. Would you agree? 
And let's be honest, some of you look in the mirror and say, man, do you even please yourself? So if you can't even please yourself, how in the world are we going to ever please others? But Jesus goes on to say, for John came neither eating nor drinking. He was a real tight, straight-laced Christian, so to speak. And they say he has a demon. Who said that? The religious people. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He said, but in the end, wisdom will be proved right by our actions. In other words, so I understand that. Now, some of you think that I take it too far, and my job is to make you feel miserable. I don't have any desire to make anybody feel miserable. I'm just not going to cut out the truth because it's not convenient. I think we need the truth about what Jesus had to do and say and stuff that way. Now, if you will, over in the book of Mark, chapter 11, we've got this story about Jesus. And as Mark relays, Matthew talks about it, Mark talks about it, Luke talks about it, and John talks about it, each of them in a different way. John almost moves it way up earlier in the ministry, but it's so difficult because none of them typically relay chronologically, other than Luke pretty much tried to put his in somewhat of a chronological order. But I'm going to use Mark here because of, of what it says first. So chapter 11, it begins with this triumphal entry uh, that we typically talk about and you know, most churches do on Palm Sunday because that's when it happened, the week before what we call Easter, what I call Resurrection Sunday, what they were thinking of as the Passover that was coming on that Saturday. But anyway, I want you to see this. So Jesus comes riding into town. The people are welcoming. They're just ecstatic because just a few uh, months earlier, he'd raised Lazarus from the dead. And I mean, this guy was stone cold dead, been in the tomb for four days, so probably dead, but at least six of those. And they ra he raised him from the dead. And uh, so he, that brought about a certain amount of fame. And everybody's like, man, this is the guy we want to go to war with because you can go running into the battle and you get killed. What will he do? He'll resurrect you bring you back to life. You don't have to fear anything. And it's ironic that that's what Jesus called us to do, to die to ourselves. Why? He can bring us back, but to bring us back is more than what we were. And that's been my experience with him. Anyway, we read here that they went through this triumphal entry. And then I want you to look down at verse 11. So this day happened, that Sunday came in, he rides in on this donkey and a variety of other things. And that evening... And I presume before sunset or before 6 o'clock, that area, whatever, because that's when their day began. But that evening, it says, just this little thing in verse 11, Jesus entered Jerusalem, and he went to the temple. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. So it was already late. The day was about done. I presume they were folding up things and getting ready to close the doors. And so he looked, and then he left. Now, the part of that that brings curiosity to my mind is, you know, that's, it's just kind of an odd thing. Mark's the only one that tells this, because what I want to look at is what then he set out to do as we read on down to verse 12. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, so that night he looked, left, went back to Bethany, which is where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were from. So it doesn't say he stayed with them, but quite possibly, but at least he had a place there that he stayed. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, so Bethany's up over here. And they're going to come down the Mount of Olives and then back into the city. So he's leaving Bethany. He was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find, any, find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it wasn't the season for figs. I, this is one of those confusing things that I would have thought Jesus ought to know that. But then he says to this tree, may, you may no one ever eat fruit from you again. His disciples heard him say that. And then it goes on into what? Now, what you read on down, you'll find out that what happened? The next day, that fig tree was withered up and dead. Jesus and the spoken word. But in a lot of ways, his is more powerful, but in a lot of ways, no, it's not. We have on the tip of our tongue life and death. Which do we speak the most of? But now, verse 15, getting into the story. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area where he'd just been the night before and looked things over. He entered this temple area. He began driving out those that were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he wouldn't allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. And it didn't bring good news to him because these chief priests, all the religious people didn't have room I want to tell you that because I think it's vital that if you're going to really walk the Christian life, there's going to be time that it's going to be the religious people are going to give you the hardest time. I want to tell you that because I want us to all be on guard that we don't become so religious that we're, we're locked in 
that our minds aren't open, our hearts aren't open, that we don't know the Spirit of God? I mean, Jesus was a rebel, but he's a rebel with a cause. And I know I, was, I, I would have to assess my life prior to really turning it over anew to Christ as being pretty realist. In fact, that was one of the things that nearly kept me from going into the ministry. I was like, but God, you know, I just don't like rules. I, I kind of like to break them, but I don't like them, you know? And, and it wasn't all rules. It was just, but, you know, that's good for you, but I want to do this. And his call to me was, all right, give that to me. Because I'll take your rebellion and change it into where you'll be rebellious for the good things against the wrong, not just rebellious. And I don't mean to wear that as I've done such a great job of that, but I know his spirit has worked in me, and it's why I will preach things to you that a lot of people won't, and it doesn't make me better than them. It's just that I really wholeheartedly believe that for too many years, the church has begun, especially the American church, we treat God like he's our genie. If we bow down or we do this or come to church three weeks in a row, you owe me a favor. And if we don't see him perform for us, then forget you, God. I, I did all this and it didn't change a thing. And the whole point of it being is, is Jesus is the change agent. It ought, he doesn't need to change for me. I need to change for him. But the religious people will expect God to be in a box and they're going to keep it there. Well, what was going on then is over time, they had become so steeped in their tradition that over time, what happened then was these great big festivals, and there were like three of them every year, three of the major ones, all the Jews that could possibly afford to get loose and come to Jerusalem would from all parts of the world. They would go ahead and shut up their shops or you know, put the farm maybe in the hands of some servants or whatever, but the whole family would walk or ride maybe mules or whatever it might be, but they would make their way, this track, this pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And as they went, they went for one reason, because these were the high feasts or the holy feasts. These were the big ones, and it included the atonement, it included Thanksgiving, and it included this, this Passover when they remembered back when the death angel passed over all the houses that had blood over the doorpost. And so they would come. Now, the way that it worked was that you aren't supposed to come without a sacrifice. And there were various sacrifices depending on what you did, both for uh, your children, but also for sin, also for, you know, grave things that might have been done. And then there were the offerings that took place as well. Well, what these families found out was, and it's kind of like what they began to see, those that lived in Jerusalem was, hey, this can work in our favor. We'll help you and you can help us. And so what started out being very gracious was, you know, Jim Bob and his family over here that had to travel 100 miles on foot, you know, by the time you bring the animals, it's tough enough with your kids, by the time you bring your animals and stuff like that, man, you can't carry enough food for the animals and keep your sacrifice clean. Why don't you just leave those there, sell one, and then come and buy one from me? Well, that made sense. And that did make it a lot easier. So here's a perfect sacrifice. Let me buy it. And then the other thing they started doing was as these people were coming from various parts of the world, just like if you've ever traveled abroad, that you have to exchange the currency somehow, right? And so what they did is these people brought in their other currencies or coins that didn't match the Jerusalem one. There was certain temple coins that had to be used. And so don't worry about it. Here, you can buy some from us. Thus, we have money changers. We have the birds, the doves, that were a part of normal sacrifices. Uh, in the book of Luke, I believe it is, he talks about him uh, overturn not only overturning that, but turning the cattle loose and stuff like that. So they had the bulls and the goats and all this stuff were in there. Now, so he's got the money changers. What had happened then is these people, and it's much like church can get if we're not careful, these people had gotten so used to doing this that they didn't even question their motives. And in time, what they began to do was to profit off of their brothers and sisters from these other countries coming in. And when I mean profit, what I mean is, oh, they would escalate the price of that bull or that good sheep or that goat or the doves. And they were making money off of it. Then they would make money off the exchange of the money. And greed was really taking it. Now, we would look and go, that's terrible, but I want us to look instead at us as a body 
and our church that we go to, let's make sure that we look at ourselves sometimes and question, why do we do what we do? And do we do things to make people pay for it, you know, or do we do things to help our brothers and sisters get to know and see the Lord? So when Jesus looked that first day, he saw it. And I personally, and I can't go to bat for him here, but I think that he looked at I think he was showing wisdom and restraint. He saw this stuff going on, and inside it just made his blood boil, so to speak. And I don't mean that he lost his temper, but it's unjust. And he was huge about justice, and yet he was huge about grace. But what he saw here was no grace being given to brothers and sisters, but taking the temple and having turned it into a merchandising place. A guy named Robert Morris defines merchandising, and, and he tied it in with one of the Hebrew or Greek words. And merchandising is actually the exchange, taking something that belongs to God and exchanging it for something else. There's actually a verse that he says that Satan exchanged. He was the leader of the worship in heaven, but he started keeping it in his prideful self. He wanted some of the adoration. He merchandised and was willing to keep for himself that which was God's. There are all kinds of ramifications that if you're curious, and I think that that's what we ought to be. I want curious people. I want thinkers. I don't want you to come in and just believe what I say. I want you to come in, look at the word. I want you to think with your mind, and I want you to ask God, God, what makes sense here, and why did my heart, was I uncomfortable with what that was said there? Why was I inside thinking, I want to justify myself real quickly or whatever? And the reason being is, is, folks, that's the only thing that will keep us from becoming religious. Some people, and that's one of the things from day one, I told that church in Southern Illinois, I said, man, I hate religion. And what I meant by that was religion is oftentimes a mindless monotony of motion. You just do what you've done because you've always done it. And if anybody changes it, then it's the seven dying words of the church. We've never done it that way before, as if something's being robbed. And the truth is, sometimes we need a different approach. Why? So we see all the angles of him. But the notorious thing for most churches is we begin to do things that we like. We begin to come to church for what we expect and want to get, and we fail to ever come as the sacrifice, saying, Lord, this is all I got. This is all I am. Remember the two guys talking about prayer, the two guys that Jesus saw praying? The one that was, had the bad reputation, that beat his breast and just said, oh, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then the righteous religious guy over here that stood up and said, oh, God, I'm so glad that I'm so good and I'm so holy and I'm not like that guy over there. Which one did Jesus like? The humbled man. And I share that, and I know that's not comfortable, and I know, but I'm not trying to tell you I think that's what you are. I'm saying, look in the mirror. But if we really want to walk with God, won't we ask him, God, how do I appear? Don't we want to think about church and what are we selling? And I don't necessarily mean merchandising. I'm just saying, uh, I've got people all the time that want to do fundraisers and this and that. And I just, the leadership and I, I mean, we really feel to our core that this is a part of, we've got to be cautious about that. Because if all we're doing is selling, the world looks at it and goes, yeah, this church is, man. They get by and they don't even have to pay taxes like my business does. But what we ought to be selling people on is selling that we're fully sold out to Jesus Christ, right? Amen. And that we really do, and I can't make you or whatever, but I really do believe this is God's word. And I really do believe that if I'm doing something outside of it, that I'm choosing to do, receive less than what God wants for me. And that if it says it, then why wouldn't I? And if there's things that I've left out of my life or my walk and I read in the scriptures and I see that other people, why wouldn't I? Some of you have been told baptism is no big deal. Is that what the Bible says? Others of you have been convinced that, you know, the Holy Spirit is, man, just leave him alone because people get the, too much Holy Spirit go crazy, you know? Is that what the Bible says? 
You know, the scriptures are there for us to understand and to learn. And as a body of believers, we're going to be the best off the more we hold on to those. Not Steve's teaching, not branches of Christ. We don't have a doctrine. It's just this. It's just this. And the reason that we do what we do in our leadership, that we pray and we talk about the word of God, because that's what we believe our job is. It's not to lead this church and tell people what to do. It's to protect the church and make sure that we're not leaving anything out. Or that if we start this, that it doesn't end up taking us in a direction away from Christ instead of toward him. But I want you, as I mentioned earlier there, what I learned in Bible college, you know, if you will, and you don't have to close your eyes because some of you already have, and that's fine, just don't snore out loud. But if you close your eyes, can, can you be the followers of Jesus here? And you go in, you're going to the temple, and it's like going to church, and you're expecting he's going to go in there, and man, he's going to probably share some kind of love, maybe do some healing or whatever it may be. And, and so this is going to be one of those holy moments. We're going to the temple. And man, I mean, it was so cool the way Jerusalem was designed and the temple mount and all this stuff. And even just the outer area was really cool. But then as you get on into the inner court and then there's the Holy of Holies that only one person once a year could go into. But imagine you're doing it with Jesus and you're going in there and you're used to it. You've seen it before. Here are the animals, here are the people, some of them looking like they've traveled miles, they had, and they're going in. And all of a sudden, Jesus goes nuts. It says in one of the Gospels that he braided this cord and made a whip out of it. So I don't know whether he took the binder twine or the rope that some of these animals have been tied with and put them together and you know, put a knot in it and whipped it around like that. But man, he started scattering everything. He said he turned over these benches that the pigeons were on or the doves and man i don't know about you but you ever been around doves or pigeons when they take off a couple things that take place number one there's always feathers flying if they get you know spooked and there's usually dust because their wings it's just amazing what can whip up and usually they kind of go i'm going to unload things here before i take off so i can fly easier (laughs) you knew it was coming it's like how that guy got the hook in the eye. He looked up in a pigeon, you know. But the seagull got him, yeah. But, the, but these doves, can just imagine that. Him turning over and these birds. And, I mean, feathers in the air, dust storming all around. And the next thing you know, then he's turning over these money changers tables. And, man, coins just go like crazy. And, you know, people are going, this guy's going, these are mine, these are mine. And people are going, free money, free money. And. I've saddened to see on the news they're already looting, aren't they? But I mention that because I feel sometimes that's what we do at church. We loot. We don't bring anything. We just come to take whatever we can put our hands on and let everybody else do their thing. Jesus was saying, this isn't right. And they turned the cattle and these lamb and sheep, and I mean, it's just suddenly the livestock auction became just this mass bedlam until the dust settled. And Jesus is pretty pointed with what he has to say. He said, this is my father's house. It's to be a house of what? Prayer. But you've turned it into a den of thieves or robbers. I'm concerned. 40 years later, I, I don't want to pastor a church where We're a den of thieves. We're takers. That we take the blessings of God, but we don't want a tribulation, Lord. We'll take advantage of the people around us, but we don't want them to expect anything back from us. It's just real easy to not be servants, right? To not serve. I mean, it's easier unless it's somebody you like and it's something you want to do. But let me tell you, some of the greatest things that God's taught me is when, like just with preaching, I never wanted to do that, but in it, I know I can't do it without him. And in preaching, I know that it makes me come face to face, first of all, with who I am and my unworthiness and the the fear. I don't want to just get up here and present a message. I mean, I've got sermons that I wrote for Bible college and stuff like that that you would love because it's just boom, 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 goes right down through it. It's plain and simple, no added stuff. I know some of you get lost because I, what do you, you know, you're going here and then you went around the barn. 
You know why? Because I try to listen to him. And I may be going around the barn and it may not be entertaining to you. And you may go, man, if you'd leave this out of it, we could get out of here at least 10 minutes sooner, Steve. But you don't get to hear or see the text or hear the people that with tears in their eyes will say, I can't believe that you knew. I didn't. He does. And what he does at times is he's going to preach a message. That's why I don't think I've ever told any of you, listen to everything I say today. I've never said that. Because to me, it's all about you getting what he said to you. And so as big brothers and sisters, we endure and we listen to a lot of things because our little brother, little sister may need it. Sometimes little brothers and sisters, you endure a lot because it's your big brother, big sister that's just not paid attention for a while. But God's trying to speak to us, trying to continue to change us. He didn't just want us to change once and accept him. He wants to continue. That just began the change. I don't know about in your family, but in ours, man, we had a wall. We had a doorpost. Did we just take the pencil and put initials by? Did you ever do that? Why? To see how you've grown. And man, you'd do everything you could to, you know, and they wouldn't let you be on your tiptoes. You had to take all the shoes off because it was going to be real. And that was back in the Farrah Fawcett hairdo days. And, you know, <laughs> mom and dad, uh-uh, man, that ruler's going flat on the skull. It's that you don't get to count big hair. I actually had a lot of big hair. That's what, 40 years of ministry, I blame it on you, not Julie, okay? It just <laughs> pulled my hair out. But, but you know, we would, we would do that to see how we'd grow. And you wanted to grow, what, not at all or more? When was the last time that you said, God, measure me? Have I grown? Where am I at? And bigger to him is oftentimes not higher, it's down lower. Because even he, the Son of Man, didn't come to be served, but to what? Serve. And yet somehow or another, it's, we've turned it into a dirty four-letter word. Work and serve in the church. Nah. Oh, I have to. I feel obligated. I need to do something. I, no. You're obligated, all right, but it's not to anybody here. It's to him. What would it take for this place to become a house of prayer? I can tell you one of the stark things in Europe that is just amazing is most of the cathedrals have now become museums. I did a wedding a few years back and it was once a cathedral and it was an event center. You know what, how churches die? It's when people just go for themselves and take what they can get. I uh, need to wrap up, I know. I've actually got two passages that I want to read. The one I'll do real quick here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. The reason I do is because Paul said that this is what God showed him, that there would be terrible times in the last days, and this was 1,900 years ago, so we're in the latter part of the last days compared to where he was. I don't mean by that to predict when Jesus is coming back, but Paul's telling his young son in the faith, not truly a blood son or anything, but a kid that early in his life started following Paul and going with him and he saw a lot of hope and promise and he left him in Ephesus to lead that church to be a preacher even when he was young and Paul then wrote these two letters and I'm sure Timothy had written at least two to Paul and Paul's trying to encourage him but Paul encourages him with truth and so in 2 Timothy 3 1 we read this mark this there'll be terrible times in the last days people will be lovers of themselves he didn't know, but he could have said, people will be taking selfies all the time. <laughs> Don't we? They'll be lovers of themselves. Nothing much will change, but they'll be lovers of money. Whenever we would rather have the money than we would be a part of the church, or when we'll rearrange our schedule to do something that will get us money, but we won't rearrange our schedule to serve, we could fall into that category. Boastful. Oh, I did this for the Lord. Proud. But they become abusive. Disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful. Lacking thanks in that regard. Ungrateful. Unholy. When was the last time that you recognized and said I may be good enough 
but I'm sure not holy. God, help me to become more holy. Without love, unforgiving, anybody got any unforgiveness that to somebody that still gets into you that you haven't just fully let go and prayed for? Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, but treacherous, rash. Some of the stuff that we see, huh? I mean, people just shooting people just because they don't like them. Treacherous, rash, conceited. And then this one, I think, really applies to the American church. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. We will about do anything and spend anything for feeling good, won't we? And then to make sure that Paul or Timothy understands that Paul's talking about the church because he's not talking about the world. He's talking about in the church. He said, having a form of godliness, that's religion, but denying its power have nothing to do with them. That last part's hard for me to understand, have nothing to do with them. Because aren't we all a part of that? But you see, there's a difference in the eyes of God when we, uh, the difference between wrong but wanting to become and seeking him to become right versus wrong and saying, I don't care, he's got to take me. I think repentance is supposed to be in our DNA as Christians because the closer we walk to him, the more we begin to see the dirt that we always had. But I see this and I'm fearful. I don't want to pastor a church where that's the case, do you? Pastor a church or go to a church like that. And finally, as Kale and the team come up, if you will, I'm going to share with you a passage from last Wednesday night over here in Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. Now, as we make this shift, I forgot to insert this one thing. You see, Jesus went to what area when he overturned the money changers? The, the began the T? The temple. He went to the temple. What that same Jesus later on expressed and ha helps us to understand is that what in him we are the temple of God. We are. And it's our mind and our heart that we decide, are we merchandisers or are we servants? Are we all about ourselves and God give me this and that or are we really about praying for others? James says you have not because you ask not, but he said the sad thing is so many of you, when you ask, you ask with selfish motives to get what you are asking for to spend on yourself. But God really wants us to be praying for change. Our own, that radical change that the Holy Spirit will do, but also so that we can reach others for Him. And if there's one thing that I found is that, man, there are a lot of people out there that really do want to know about God. But they see so many things that turn them off that they begin to presume if we're like that, God must not be who I thought that he was. And so it does make a difference what we say with our mouth, doesn't it? And I know it's a hard thing to change. It does make a difference when we serve versus when we criticize and judge. I want you to see how important your prayers are to God in this temple of yours that he would fill his Holy Spirit with that we could then, with the help of the Spirit, pray John says, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Something took their breath away. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. I presume that that was in silence. And any of us that have ever been to an honor ceremony with the soldiers and folding the flag or something on that order or playing taps, that's kind of the feeling I get this was. These seven angelic soldiers are given trumpets and they're holding them waiting for the command. But then there's an eighth. Another angel, verse 3, said, who had a golden censer. And our Catholic brothers and sisters know all about this. We didn't have those spoken things in our church. But man, when I see them at a funeral and stuff like that, I get the feeling. They said, man, he was given a uh, this golden censer he stood at the altar and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints I see this 
I don't like that one as well. My Bible says saints. And the reason I like saints is because we are, if you're in Christ. It's not something you die to become. You are a saint unless you choose not to live that way. But he was given much incense to offer. The prayers of all God's people or all God's saints on the golden altar in front of the throne. And then it goes on to say that this smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God and from the angel's hands. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire. But this picture of this is God breathing it in. It's God hearing our prayers and not just going, too many of us watched that Jim Carrey movie where he thought he was God. That's not how God's like. Oh, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. No. He carefully listens to your prayers, if they're prayers from broken hearts especially. And he listens, and he wants to hear. And then he, as the Almighty God, is able to take those prayers and to, to personally see each one of us and to hear the cry of our heart and to see us in the plight or whatever we may be in. And occasionally then he hears the praises and stuff, but he takes each of those, and according to Romans 8, then he takes it and decides, in view of all of his mercy, he looks at and says, how will my answer to your prayer affect everything else? Because his promise is he'll work everything to good. And so today, can we be a house of prayer? And not just praying for the sick and this and that, and I don't mean that that's not a good thing. I'm just saying sometimes before we can pray for others, we need to pray about our own heart, don't we? And God, here I am. I surrender all. If you will, let's stand and respond.
Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior is in me wonderful. Sing hallelujah, Christ is churches it's only for their members and for us it's about being a member of Jesus not about being a member of branches and so as communion is offered to you it was Jesus's way of saying hey I don't want you to forget in the midst of everything else that goes on that first of all I climbed into a human body I climbed into flesh the whole word Emmanuel God with us in the flesh so that I could experience mankind and know what you feel and experience. And so he thirsted, he hurt, he got tired. I mean, all these different things, he got hungry. And it was so that he could relate with us as human beings. But the cool part is he never did lose this divine side that kept his blood pure, the inoculation for sin. And it says that it sets us free. And I encourage you as we looked at, uh, you can go back and listen to last Wednesday night, but. Or you can go read it for yourself in Romans 9 where it talks again and again about the blood and how fortunate we are that we aren't sacrificing but goats and bulls and doves and wringing their heads off and all this stuff for all those sacrifices. Wow, thank you, Jesus. And he took care of all that and paid for our sin. And so it's us remembering that. It's us knowing it's all about him. There's only one other thing that I want to say in the midst of that, and it's this. I have people ask me at times, so do you have any regrets? Do you wish you'd have been a lawyer? Absolutely none. I can honestly tell you I can't even go there. I mean, in the sense I can, but it's like, no. I think I could have, but I never would have known the Lord the way I know. I needed ministry. And that's the thing that is so phenomenal about it is it's what I wanted to run from. But it was in ministry that God brought about more of a, not just, it's certainly not just knowledge. It's, it's oh, I didn't know how bad I needed a Savior. But I know now. And I am fully convinced that Jesus is it. Do I have any regrets? None. Other than that, uh, I wish I would have sought to allow him to create more holiness in me. But I have no regrets. Has it ever been hard? Yeah. Ever wanted to quit? Not because of anybody, just because of me. And I share that because God's calling you to ministry. It may not be as a pastor. I can't tell you what it would be, but I'll guarantee you that there's not one part of ministry he's calling you to, but what he'll call people to you, people that you need more than you ever will believe. 
and it's you all that have made it worthwhile except a couple of you but the rest of you have made it very very worthwhile God and Father thank you for loving us so much that you would send your son but thank you for loving us so much that uh, Lord uh, I don't know just that the wholehearted acceptance that you gave and that Jesus must have really, really covered us with his blood, Lord, for you to be able to love us and for him to want to marry us, his church. May we, God, live out our lives wanting the church to become all that's worthwhile for you to come back and get. No longer excusing ourselves, no longer critical, Lord, of others, but just looking to ourselves, looking to your word, believing what you've said and allowing your sanctification to take place as we mix together with the very people, Lord, that will do that. And I, 40 years later, Lord, between Julie and the people that I've had the privilege to serve, you've changed me and you're not done yet. And I thank you for that. And I just pray that we would have that fellowship and that time of prayer with you now. That, Lord, that as each one of us prays, you're so God that you hear us as if we're the only one praying. May it be sweet incense that you inhale and hold on to. And may we, Lord, hold on to your every word in Jesus.